This is Debrief, brought to you by the Australian Industry Group. Yes, indeed. Hello and welcome back to Debrief, your monthly briefing on the developments in industry policy, particularly within the frame of the economic changes on business digitalisation, business and industry decarbonisation and the diversification of our business and economy to reduce risks and single point of failure. Debrief, a briefing on the Ds. <laughs> My name is James Scotland, coming to you from Yungenbar country today. And with me, as always, to unpack the issues of the month as only she can, is my co-host, an industry policy specialist and the head of industry policy and development for the Australian industry group, Louise McGrath. Hello, Louise. How are you today? Hi, James. I'm calling in from Wurundjeri country. And we should note that even though we're in different um, parts of Australia, we both had the same recovery of COVID this week. It's been a tough week. Yeah, I know. Let's let's <laughs> let's feel sympathetic to each other and struggle through as best we can. Um, I'm going to wear a T-shirt that says I'm a survivor of man flu. You, you do the best whatever you can do. <laughs> We've got a lot to talk about. There's been a lot going on. Um, I Before I got sick, I was traveling around uh, talking to people uh, in uh, in various workshops and conferences, and and members and non-members alike are excited about future made in Australia because they think it means it's a new made in Australia program, and we're going to encourage you know small businesses to to make more in Australia. Louise, that's not right, is it? No, um, it it is a bit unfortunate. I mean, I think it's an election campaign slogan, frankly. I mean, it sounds great, as many of these things do, but it's really clear that it's not industry policy. It's economic transformation policy. And the biggest evidence I point towards that is that when the legislation was recently introduced into Parliament, it wasn't Ed Husick, industry minister, but um, Jim Chalmers, treasurer, who who released it to Parliament. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as we discussed last month, and everyone did the homework of reading Stephen Kennedy's speech, you know, this industry support program is is really um, ramping up all around the world. The industrial, the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, and this is sort of our answer to it. You know, plus all the answers to um, the IRA that every other country is doing. There's this a big shift in really supporting supporting industry, but because of this uh, decarbonisation transformation that's required, and and governments around the world understanding that they can't just provide, you know, sticks. They need to provide some real carrots to really uh, drive that investment. And so Treasury has decided you can't beat them, let's join them, but let's do it on our own terms and, and take it over. So they're really driving FMIA. And as um, they, every briefing I've received, and, and I think even at, at Stephen Kennedy's speech, the, the phrase they keep using is small yard high fence. Yeah, interesting, isn't it? Uh, when we uh, – the in that Inflation Reduction Act, the tag for that from President Biden was industrialization via decarbonization. And they're going to rebuild American industry. And, and when they talk about rebuild, of course, we built it once before, but last time we had no idea what was going to happen. Uh, and this time it seems like we still haven't learned the lesson from, from last time. It's, uh, we're going to try and figure out a way to help people understand what it all means. Why is there so much confusion about future made in Australia, FMIA? Well, because it, it sounds like what we're talking about is supporting Australian manufacturing, which we kind of are, but it's not all manufacturing. So it's it's just though it's really narrow into the areas um, where we think we have Australian, uh, you know, a certain edge or a competitive edge. So around hydrogen, around critical minerals, um, solar panels and batteries have been uh, nominated. So those technologies that will need that will be required by the entire economy for this decarbonisation. And the only thing really to help um, industry to adjust is there's a little bit of funding in green metals, and we can talk about green metals in a moment, but but none of it is around, you know, I'm I'm a skincare manufacturer in Dandenong and I need to reduce my carbon footprint. No, nothing like that. It's only for the – it's really narrow. Yeah, yeah. Has there been any announcements yet? Have we got any idea about the sort of things that they're, they're going to promote 
or what they're going to support? Oh, yeah. So the, the announcements um, were very much in the last budget. So $22.7 billion over 10 years, but uh, which sounds a lot, worth remembering that the Inflation Reduction Act is $500 billion more um, than the $22 billion, yeah. and that is <laughs> over 10 years. So the next financial year, it's only $400 million. So it's not a lot of money. But the, the big projects which will be delivered through ARENA uh, will be um, for solar manufacturing, solar panel manufacturing, so $83 million over 10 years, battery manufacturing, $69 million over eight years, uh, low carbon fuel, liquid fuels. So think about air, air fuels. Um, Five point two million over four years, and then green metals, which is three million over six years. That's you know, um, Tennant um, had a, a a nice joke, or he, he quoted a joke from a, a Woody Allen movie where there's this um, two women are eating at a restaurant, and one of them says, "Oh, this food here is awful." And the other says, yes, and the servings are so small. So I think (laughs) that's how everyone feels about FMIA. It's, well, these are outrageously small mugs and also you're investing in the wrong things. The wrong area, yeah. Yeah. Tenant Reid is our uh, head of um, uh, energy and environment and uh, he's a a funny man uh, and a wise man. Hello, Tenant. Uh, What the hell is green metal? So green metals... um, Yes, so it's a good question. So obviously we we produce steel and iron in Australia and, you know, we've got two main companies, Blue Scope and One Steel, and it's very carbon intensive. So they've got safeguards, mechanisms, you know, grow them so that it's, you know, that part that one of the small number of companies in Australia that actually have some parameters around their carbon footprint and and what they need to do to reduce it. Green metals uh-huh. is can you produce these steel items, steel and iron, et cetera, using renewable energy. Okay. Or so so that's essentially hydrogen. But it's also I mean the the, the steel companies are focused not just on the fuel source, but also what they can do on recycling. So this okay. is mm. um you know, if they can because steel is is quite a good recyclable product. Now, there isn't that much, though. So we've got a member who does, you know, global steel recycling. They and, and the steel companies are aware that some of our waste policies, and this is the, the challenge, you know, what which do you fix first? Some of our waste policies are actually not helping the green metals policy because a lot of our potential feedstock for recycled steel are leaving the country in the form of cars and white goods because there's a lot of steel mm-hmm. in those products. Right, yeah, yeah. But they're not listed, of course, as steel exports. They're just, you know, white goods and, and cars. Yeah, and yeah. finished product. <clears throat> that's right. So there isn't any restriction on those exports. They would like to see some restrictions because that would really help them reduce their cut. But I think one thing that's unclear with green metals is what the demand is yeah, because, yeah. I mean, there's – you know, we're in buildings right now, there's metals, we'd have no idea what I mean, it's like all these fungible products in you know, such as critical minerals, etc. Everyone talks about wanting either green or ESG or a whole range of, you know, added benefits, but it makes absolutely no difference to the performance. Well, it shouldn't make any difference to the performance. Yeah, right. So it doesn't matter how you get there. It's still the same product, uh, but it does matter. Uh, so is the government going to support this actively? Is that what you're saying? Well, that... The, they're asked. They've, they've said, what can they do to produce, you know, to increase demand? I mean, they could, and some members did put this forward as an idea, you know, they could start mandating green steel in all infrastructure builds, et cetera. But, you know, infrastructure costs are now already over budget. And I'm in Victoria and famously we're, we're going into horrendous debt as, as our infrastructure um, projects um, costs go up and up and up. If you added an overlay of green steel, I mean, be astronomical. We can afford to do anything, so it's probably not helpful. Yeah, so that sounds tricky. Mm. That sounds tricky. It sounds like eventually we're going to have to do that to get to our decarbonisation targets, mm. and yet it's going to have an immediate inflation uh, effect at a time when there's high inflation or when there's inflation anyway. Right. And there's no guarantee that that would mean that we produce green steel in Australia. 
because we'd still have to meet our international obligations. So, you know, there are countries, particularly Germany, I think, and the Netherlands who are further advanced in using hydrogen to produce steel. And, you know, if we were the first mover, for example, to make that requirement, um, they would certainly, you know, that would pique their interest, come to the market, and we wouldn't be able to stop. We've got a lot of hydrogen projects around the country. Do we have to wait for those hydrogen projects to be built and to be ready before we can start making, you know, green metals? Uh, look, I think so. I, it's, it seems so complicated because that, those hydrogen projects aren't necessary next to the steel production. And, you know, as you know, hydrogen's a tricky thing to, to move. Yeah. And, yeah. and companies yeah. today, and this is the challenge, companies today are investing in, you know, their own, infrastructure they're doing maintenance etc cetera, etc cetera, making all sorts of decisions and because they don't have the, the surety of um, a change in government policy so these are one of the things um, that we've certainly called on so we've done a submission on the green medals and also our submission on future made in australia so they're both on our website and um, i might add those to the homework list People interested in similar. Yeah, I was going to uh, going to circle back to this future made in Australia because it's all part of the same issue. Before I do, uh, there was a story a while ago where there was a big proposal in Western Australia, northwest uh, in in northwestern Australia, to build a, a large hydrogen facility, and uh, a long way down the path towards getting final approval, they decided to close it down because it was too far from the market. Um, they could make the green hydrogen efficiently in northwestern Australia, but then they had to transport it, and so eventually. They said, no, we're going to build it closer to Perth, uh, which is not as efficient, but closer to a market. I think those kind of decisions are still a long way from being fully understood. Yeah, I think the technology on hydrogen, I mean, it's not my expertise, but um, or mine. it does. Okay, it, I just think the ambition of hydrogen doesn't match the reality of technology. Well, let's talk about the uh, the submission on Future Made in Australia, just to wrap that up. Uh what are the recommendations that you, well, some of the recommendations that you're uh, putting forward on industry policy? Well, first of all, I'll just um, cover off gui- um, Treasury's guide on on how they're going to conduct the sectorial assessments. So they they said it's not just just because you're in solar panels and you know da da da, da you know you're going to get the money. No, that they, they, they want they're trying to put some principles. So that's whether Australia would could be competitive in the sector whether the sector could contribute to an orderly path in the net zero transformation, including through the use Mm -hmm. of renewable energy, whether the sector... That's a good good one. ...whether the sector could build the capabilities of the Australian people and the regions of Mm. Australia and generate employment opportunities, whether support for the sector could improve Australia's economic resilience and security, and whether support for the sector could recognise the key role of the private sector and deliver genuine value for money. Sounds good. Yeah, they all sound quite reasonable. Most <laughs> things do sound quite reasonable. It's not until you get to the detail. <laughs> okay, get to the detail. Anyway, so we've just said, look, <laughs> there are some general improvements we think could be made to the whole legislation that could give um, industry certainty to, to really drive investment. And the first is a greater degree of certainty around the policy measures because some of these things, there aren't any hard definitions. So what, what builds the capabilities of the Australian people? What on earth does that mean? Does that mean... Every FMIA project needs to have a training program. Who knows? Good. It doesn't build. Um, that helps, but doesn't build. More immediacy in delivering policy and investment outcomes. I mean, this is, you know, going to be a long process, but Treasury isn't ne- Treasury and um, isn't necessarily um, empowered to, to make these decisions at the moment. So how quickly they're going to make these decisions? All this money is going to be funneled through Arena. We're really keen to make sure that they um, increase their own capabilities so that they've got the resources to to respond to requests and to process things quickly and make us quick assessments, et cetera. A third recommendation is stronger principles and criteria around the support measures. So, you know, is it always going to be a tax credit, is it cash, loans, et cetera? No, right. yeah. Deeper policy coordination between government agencies, and this is, you know, as I was talking about, you know, with green metals, there's um, DQ, Department of Environment, there's Department of Industry, there's DFAT, you know, there's a whole range of agencies that need to be involved in this. So uh, the announcement um, recently on the, the cabinet reshuffle 
has been quite was quite good in that Tim Ayres, who was previously Assistant Minister for, for Manufacturing, Assistant Minister for um, Trade, is now uh, remains Assistant Minister for Trade, but also Assistant Minister for Future Made in Australia. And more importantly, from a ministerial point of view, reports directly to the Prime Minister, no longer reports to Mr Husick. Good. So that really gives him that imprimatur from the Prime Minister's office to, to go across. So I think that's a really, um, I think that's a really important measure, and will help with that policy coordination. Um, the extension of support to existing as well as new to Australia industries. So let's not just you know solar panels. There are a few companies here. Are there some? But really, hydrogen. We're going to have to bring new companies to Australia for that. And finally, ensuring that community benefit principles are complementary to objectives, and that's where I was, you know, talking about those principles of build capabilities of Australian people in the regions of Australia and generate employment opportunities. We're already at full employment. I think, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's good. I, I, one of the, you know, as we often say, one of the purposes of this podcast is to, to say to people that we can hear a lot of news, but someone has to go deeper into what the announcements are and try and figure out what it means for Australian business. And, uh, you know, I, I love talking to you each month to get an idea that there's actually a team of people that are, are trying to figure out what it means for industry and for business and how to make it to make it work. Uh, going back to your point about greater policy coordination and <laughs> a question without notice to sound like a politician. Um, when I'm sort of talking to people about sustainability, they say we need this to be a whole of Australia approach. We only get to our targets by all of us working together. But then when I go over to the defence industry, they say we can only do this as a whole of Australia approach. We need to be all working together. Question without notice is, are we working better together? Are the other are ministers and the departments able to have greater integration of policy now or are you shooting for a moonshot on that? I always, I do smile internally when I hear people say, oh, we all need to, to work collaboratively. What that, I think they really mean is if only everyone could hear what I think, they'd all agree with me. And Well, I agree with that. <laughs> if everyone could hear what I thought, that would be good. So, uh, yes, I agree. There's a, there's a lot of challenges in um, policy coordination. I mean, digital policy is a great example because we have DFAT out there negotiating great digital um policies in our free trade agreements, but then we have individual government departments calling for, you know, data house in Australia, all that sort of stuff, in contra- contravening our own um, arrangements that we've we've negotiated in our FTA. So there is a problem that um, sometimes coordination doesn't always uh, work best way that we, we would hope. I mean, I, and I guess that's our role. I mean, we find that when we talk to different government departments, sometimes we're just saying, hey, did you know that this other government department is working on on this issue? And they go, oh, no, really, who should I talk to? So we, we, we provide a bit of that coordinating role ourselves. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, communication, greater communication is a bit of a, I don't know, it's a, it's a question, it's one we throw around without really talking about it much, uh, which is like, what is the point? I know when I was running businesses, you know, you'd have people come in and say, we need to communicate more. So you start communicating more and they say, we don't have time for all this. Um, you know, it's, the, it's, it's just one of those things. The largest Australian workplace changes in over a decade Underpaying are about workers to impact could result in crippling fines. There will be new rules about when a casual employee the has the right employees to, employees will will have the right right to disconnect. disconnect. Workplace laws are changing. Pay attention or pay the price. Safeguard your business with Australian Industry Group. The legal experts at Australian Industry Group will help you navigate the new legislation and prepare your business for the changes. Become a member today at aigroup.com.au. We should move on. Uh, talking about sustainability, the ACCC uh, has issued a discussion paper. Tell me about that, Louise. So it's it calls itself a discussion paper on ESG and it's to try to address the fact that for, for industry to to um, successfully manage all these ES, ESG transformations, whether it's around circular economy, modern slavery, um, you know, traceability on origin of product, all that kind of stuff, they have to work together. But at the moment, 
um, a lot of the ACCC rules would prohibit that as collusion or, you know. So if, for example, the two big supermarkets got together and said, this is what we're going to, to say that we want on modern slavery, here, here are the, the parameters, here are the, the customers we think are doing well, you know, all that kind of stuff. These are customers, we, oh, sorry, suppliers we don't think are doing well. All that could potentially contravene existing ACCC regulation. And so ACCC's response is to put this paper, frankly, we're not that happy with it. We think it's a bit too narrow. Uh, it doesn't really address mm-hmm. the issues. I mean, just for example, when the red cycle, um, you know, the, the plastic, soft plastics um, packaging, yeah, the recyc- recycling yeah, yeah, program stopped. collapsed mm-hmm. and, you know, Coles and Woolworths were the two main um, companies who were suddenly, not, you know, through their own fault, but suddenly responsible for, for warehouses full of um, soft plastics. ACCC had to step in and give them permission to talk together. On, on how to address it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think it's a really good example. We always talk about, you know, these 3Ds transformation and how industry and individual companies are going to have to change their business models and change the way they think. But it's a really good example of that government itself also has to change the way it thinks and think, well, these are the big objectives, which are great, but what does that mean day to day? What do we have to change about our behaviour, about our regulations? And how do we make it easier for, for companies? Yeah, uh, good questions. Good questions. What's the next step? Well, we've put in a, a submission. We'll see what comes out. Um, I sit on the Attorney General's advisory group for modern slavery. ACCC came and presented to us. It was really clear that um, some of the issues that were raised around the table were new to them. Um, but I think it's definitely on their agenda. They understand. The gap um, that they're restricted, of course, by what regulations they have, but they're trying to provide guidance notes to help um, companies to show sort of best practice and to show examples of when companies or groups of companies do need to get permission to talk together and how to make it easier for ACC to support. Very good. Yeah. 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 Oh, um, because there are going to be some industry wide changes that are, are required. So companies talking together will be a necessary thing. Uh, we'll come back to that, no doubt. Uh, we need to talk about uh, the next sitting uh, Parliament days, which is uh, a couple of weeks, mid, mid-August. Uh, there's going to be some ransomware legislation introduced. Yeah, so we did, I think we might have talked about this previously when we talked about our cybersecurity submission, but um, before the re- reshuffle, when it was, it was Claire O'Neill, she, has, she did do a bit of media reminding people that this legislation will be coming through in the next sitting. The main thing with this ransomware legislation is that it won't make it illegal to pay a ransom if it's been seized by a cyber terrorist, but you will have to report it. And um, they promise at the moment, um, I say at the moment, they promise that that information will not be shared with any other agency. And why that's important? Because some of these cyber criminals are from, uh, uh, you know, state actors, Iran, North Korea. It's actually illegal to send Iran and North Korea money. Um, so, and, uh, you know, potentially breaking the law, which, you know, you may, it's, I'm not saying you should or shouldn't break the law, um, but people, <laughs> people do, you know, uh, uh, listening to some companies uh, uh, the last week talk about this issue, some have chosen to pay, some have chosen not to pay. I mean, you're just dealing with the criminal regardless. I can see the motivation for paying because you just want to get your data released and, and you think, well, I just need to get back to work. You know, yeah, yeah, I've got things on my mind at the moment such as getting this fixed. So we're yeah. very fortunate that a member, being, well, fortunate for us, unfortunate for them, being in our enclosures, Small family size um, business in Queensland, they had a ransomware attack. They didn't pay the ransom. Um, they very generously shared their experience with us on a webinar. That webinar is available on the website for members. It's a, it's a fabulous webinar. It's so insightful. Um, but not paying, not, you know, they completely digitalized their production. So everything was frozen all the machines, all the data, everything, customer paid you know, the customer database, et cetera, everything was frozen. It took them 12 months 
or they were back on track. Yeah. yeah. So it's not a light decision to pay or not to pay. Uh, uh, we do have concerns that sometimes, like what, like another example of another member, someone hacked into their printing network and, um, you know, a piece of paper just automatically printed until the paper ran out that said pay us a million in crypto or else kind of thing. I mean, it was it was that sophisticated. Um, they didn't have access to any other system. It was easy to ignore. But is that a ransomware attack? Should that have been reported? You know, is that the sort of thing reported? So one of the, we'll wait and see what the legislation says. We're really keen to look at what the parameters are, what sort of guidance there is for companies. The government is saying, look, Unless we know the scale of the problem, we don't know how to fix it. I mean, they're not, you know, the, the signals directorate is out there as um, counterintelligence, constantly keep trying to keep us safe, but they're not police. Yeah, and the assumption should be that everyone's going to get attacked. Absolutely. Uh, that's the that's the normal guidance. Well, that's a, a nice segue too into uh, the the World Trade Organization and. Uh, it's the digitalization program. What's happening there? There's been some changes, hasn't there? There has. So one of the challenges with the WTO is to keep up with, um, you know, modern issues. And it was been really falling short on digital trade, uh, you know, movement of data, privacy, um, it's, you know, all those sorts of elements that we just take for granted now. Really exciting news last week that, um, the what they call the JSI, but it's it's a, a joint committee led by Australia, Singapore, and Japan. So really interesting that it's from APEC. APEC. Um, so a joint committee is um, led by three companies. How, three, how countries. three countries. How joint is? There's a lovely joint <laughs> around. Yeah. So 91 countries have been part of these negotiations, and they're all around. You know, can you add tariffs to the movement of data across borders? You know, can you force um, data localization? Can you force sharing software rules? All the, these elements that are sort of the building blocks of, of the of digital world. And they reached agreement. Of note, like there's some really small countries, Benin, Laos, you know, have stepped up and said, look, we want these. We understand how important these digital trade rules are for SMEs. Europe is there. China's there. It's really disappointing that the US is not there. And I think... I understand, you know, looking at some social media that American companies are beginning to understand just what a shortcoming that will be, but it's difficult. Mm -hmm. Election year, trade's always challenging um, for, for a Democrat government. Anyway, um, Catherine Ty will, will work out what she can do there, and it's illustrative of the lack of support that the US is giving to the WTO at the moment, but in particularly not applying duties to cross-border data flows. I mean, I think that's going to be absolutely crucial in the future because there's big countries, which we've talked about before, Indonesia, India, South Africa, they're all really keen to do so. So the fact that we've got, you know, at the moment it's only about 80 countries who have signed on, um, but they've all made this commitment. And I think... Yeah, you've been... You've been, a, an, you've been an advocate of cross-border data flow improvements for a long time, haven't you? I have. I've spoken at the WTO, you know, I've done a lot of thought pieces. I think um, this is something that I've been really passionate about and worked with. It's been really quite a positive experience working with global colleagues on this because it's one thing that we all generally agree on. And I think people think, well, it's, it's Europe and America, they're going to really drive this. It's really interesting, particularly within ASEAN, the small countries, Cambodia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, et cetera, that are really keen for this because they understand that for their SMEs to trade internationally, they need financial data to be moving across sports. You need PayPal to be able to operate or Visa or, you know, all these big global companies that are unclear, American, to be able to use a framework so that data can flow quickly and easily across borders and so people can get paid. And and, and, and for new solutions to be created, uh, you know, have rules in place so that really good, clever new solutions can be put in place? Yeah, I think people don't understand the role of QR code payments in Asia. Um, because my daughter's, you know, living in India at the moment and she said, Mum, this QR code payment's here too. 
So what it means is um, a company just puts up their QR code and it just automatically makes a bank-to-bank transfer. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's, a, there's a few platforms where you can swap cash, you know, send me some cash and you'd somewhere other than you did to it. Um, a whole new world, but we need the rules so, to make it work because if there's no rules, yeah. we lose our money. Yeah. The other thing, in it, it's from a supply chain point of view, and, you know, we'll talk about the ports issue in a moment, that, that under it is trade facilitation um, measures, so digitalisation of customs documents and all transport documents. Re- this is a commitment in this agreement as well, and that would really unlock a whole lot of efficiency in supply chain. Oh, that's good news because both you and I are keen on to see some movements there. Uh, and as you say, it's not just a cross-border data flow, but it's also a cross-border uh, <laughs> parcel flow. Let's talk about the ports. In my uh, other podcast, Supply Circles, I this uh, recently the current edition uh, of Supply Circles, I talked to uh, Jim Wilson from Shipping Australia about the global container uh, shipping industry, and he argues because he represents the shipping industry that there's nothing wrong with the shipping industry. The problems are the ports. The ports are what cause all the problems. He has a has a point, although there are some other issues. Um, Tell me about the Australian ports. Well, I believe you think we should have some homework this, this month. Yeah, so um, the World Bank does a review of port performance and um, our colleague, Jeff Wilson, uh, recently released on LinkedIn an update of that, which we have used in the past, but it's always good to get an update, where our ports are still in the lowest quartile for performance. Um, Jim Wilson says in some of that report we are by far the lowest in terms of efficiency, uh, and it can be argued that the um, uh, our ports are small. And he said, no, we the World Bank compared it to equivalent ports, and our our results are terrible. I think Jeff said the yeah, same thing. That's right. Um, you know, we're, we're not the smallest country in the world, so, so it doesn't make sense that you know. You, otherwise, you'd, you'd think Fiji port would 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 be all you know filling. The last quarter, so no, it, it is a problem. And given that you know, one in four jobs in Australia relies on trade, which means one in four jobs is relying on you know, an efficient port system. And if we could improve the efficiency, then that that's going to just unlock so much value. It's going to improve productivity. Um, I, I just don't understand. Every time we put this up. Many players in the industry push back and say, no, you don't understand. Well, fine. What's the answer then? Because this can't, I mean, the, the results are there. If we don't understand what the problem is, tell us what the problem is and try to find a way to fix it. I mean, through our own agitation a couple of years ago, we did manage to get a, a Productivity Commission review into ports. It was just before um, change of government. It hasn't really landed anywhere. We think the government should be looking at that and trying to understand what they can do to improve the ports. Because, of course, shipping prices go up and down. That, that we're very sensitive to those prices. We're at the end of the line. Um, even more reason then to make sure that our ports are working as efficiently as possible. Watch this space. Let's find out more about that. Well, there you go. People have always said that I can talk underwater. It turns out that you can talk when sick. Well done. <laughs> Another fascinating episode. I hope you get better soon, Louise. Well, that's it for another episode of Debrief. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed the show, remember to like and subscribe and please tell others about the show. Feel encouraged to view our posts on LinkedIn. Go to my page, to Louise's and to the Australian Industry Group's page. And please share the post about this show to your connections and networks. Also check the show notes because there's a lot of links there that we've talked about today. Thank you again. And as we always say, if you are as opinionated as we are, please give us feedback or send a question or comment to industry.policy at aigroup.com.au. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Louise. Let's talk again in a month. Thanks, James.